Hello. Uh, hello. Can hello. I... Yes. Uh, yes, sir. This is uh, Izzy from MMA Jam Live. Uh, now Izzy, to... how you doing? Uh, I'm in the shower. I can't. I'm in the shower. I can't talk now. Okay. Can you, uh, should we call you back in how many minutes? No, 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 Izzy. I'm sorry. I'm making a joke. I'm totally ready. I'm looking forward to it. You guys have been tweeting it out like mad. Uh, I'm anxious to hear her uh, big announcement following my appearance. No, I'm totally ready. I'm all yours. Oh, boy, Campbell, what are you doing to me? <laughs> no, you have producer nerves of steel. I just was checking them out. I know. Oh, I failed that test. I really failed it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, man. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm all ready. I'm all yours. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. It's, a, it's an honor having you, by the way. Thank you so much. Uh yeah, honor's a strong word. <sighs> okay, uh, well, uh, 20, 20 years ago, back in 1993, you were obviously part of a group that founded the UFC. Uh, that group included guys like Hori and Gracie and Art Davey. Uh, how did that idea come together, and what expectations did you guys have going in? Ooh, I, I, you know what? That's a, I've never been. I've been asked a lot of questions about the beginning, but never what expectation we had. Um, it was a pretty pretty simple process, you know. The Gracies were the Gracies, you know. They were they had a training uh, system for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that was just the best. Um, they had a multi generation track record of you know being great fighters. Um, and as Horian was putting all this together, there, there was a thing a long time ago called VHS tapes, which some of you may remember, and you may actually have seen at a garage sale or something. And uh, the Gracies put out a whole library of VHS uh, training tapes, Gracie in action, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in action. And it was Art Davey that helped put those deals together and did that, and they did very well. I mean, people loved it. The system, you know, it works. Uh, and it was Art Davey who then decided to shop around an idea that he and Horian called uh, War of the Worlds. And when Art called me, he'd literally been turned down by every other producer and network, you know, in both New York and L.A. And I worked at a firm called Semaphore Entertainment Group, which was owned by Bertelsmann, the giant media company. And we were a pay-per-view company. And I was always looking for interesting stuff. And Art said he had a guy that would fight anyone, anywhere, and blah, 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 and, you know, sort of interesting. And um, as I've said before in a lot of interviews, you know, I was a big Mortal Kombat fan, and it just sort of struck me that it might be like a real version of Mortal Kombat. Um, so I had Art fly out to New York, and I got to know him, and then I met Horion, and by the time I met Horion, I was 100% in. I knew it would be a great TV show. Um, you know, Horion Gracie provided all the fight credibility uh, and, you know, his family's mystique and, you know, all the experience they'd had. Art Davey was, you know, scouting for fighters and really trying to find, uh, you know, interesting people that would take part. And, you know, my role was really I was the TV producer. You know, I was the head of programming for the company. I executive produced the shows. So for me, how to turn it into a TV show is what I really focused on. Um, and so I hope that's a little bit of the background. You know, the expectations, I don't know. I, you know, we knew it was going to be a hit. I loved it right away. It was like nothing. You know, that when I saw that first fight with Taylor, uh, Taylor Truly versus uh, Gerard Gordeau, and it lasted all of whatever, 24 seconds, and Taylor's teeth gets ticked, kicked out and he gets knocked down and, and Gordeau is like an assassin. I mean, I saw that fight. I go, nobody's seen anything like this. This is going to be huge. Uh, so I can't tell you I knew it was going to end up being, you know, UFC 173 and, you know, a world-class uh, sport event that's continually uh, discussed as a possible Olympic sport and go around the world. I can't tell you I saw that, but I knew it was going to be a hit, and I knew people would love it. Now speaking of, I, I was a, I was very young when UFC one went down. I was seven to be. Exact. I was very I young when UFC one went down. It was twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, it, it was hard for me to uh, really uh, grasp. I mean, at seven years old, I just see two guys fighting each other. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is exactly like Mortal Kombat. Um, <laughs> but I, but I remember people saying that they felt as though uh, Hicks and Gracie should have 
represented the Gracies. What were your what was your initial thought when when word came out that it would be Hoist representing the Gracies? Uh, you know, Izzy, you can't put too much. Um, you you've got to put it in the time that it happened. You know, to tell you the truth, outside of a small group of people in Southern California, you know, the Huntington Beach, Torrance area that knew the Gracies, no one knew one Gracie from another. You know, uh, I didn't. You know, I read one Playboy article uh, about Horian, and that's all I knew about Horian. When when he came to meet me in New York. I thought, you know, where am I going to take the toughest guy in the world? And I took him to a famous steakhouse named Smith & Walensky, you know, a famous spot in New York. And Orion said, you know, I don't eat meat. And I was, So that's how much I knew about the Gracies. I couldn't tell one from another, you know. And everyone had the lucky letter R, Hicks and Hoyler, Helson, you know, Hoyce, Orion, you know. Yeah, and there were a lot of them. Um, what I learned early on is, uh, it was said this way, Hickson was the carnivore and and, and and Hoist was a vegetarian. And I don't mean that in terms of meat eating. I mean that in terms of being where they were on the food chain. You know, Hickson was a very tough guy. And Hoist, Hoist looked like a model. He was so handsome. He was, you know, I, I think they said he weighed 162. I think with a couple rolls of quarters in his ghee, if the ghee was wet, he weighed 160 pounds. Um, you know, so for me, Hoist was the perfect choice. Uh, but it was really, I was, you know, I was following Horian's lead there. And Horian, Horian is so smart. Like, if you have the toughest guy win, that doesn't show the family's, you know, system works. It shows that's the toughest guy. If you bring this kind of skinny guy that doesn't look that intimidating and he beats the crap out of everyone, then your system is really something. So, again, you know, that was Horian's choice. It was perfect. And I'll tell you this, too. Look, I don't want to, you know, Hickson could come to my house and break, you know, all the bones in my body without even working up a sweat. <laughs> I don't think Hickson ever had any intention of fighting in the UFC. You know, asking for a million dollars back then, asking for a million dollars now, Dana wouldn't do it. But back then, there wasn't a million dollars. I think he never intended to fight. Well, it's, it's it's interesting because I agree with you. I think you know, Hoist was the right choice because obviously, if Hickson would have won, people would have said, oh, "Well, he's the toughest guy." But I, but I I always find myself thinking like, what would have happened had Hoist lost? I mean, in, in your opinion, do you think that would have changed? I mean, I, yeah. well, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine. But what do you mean? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, the, you, I was still on UFC too. You know, I mean, Hoist was perfect. He wasn't going to lose. But, the, you know, the, you can't take the Gracies out of the UFC. It's not possible to separate them. But then again, you know, it started to have its own force pretty quickly, too. Um, so the fact, remember what we were doing. We were doing martial art versus martial art on that first one. And as it became mixed martial arts in the development, that's what starts to change it, you know. And, you know, and, and what Horian always said, once we started to put in weight classes, time limits, et cetera, it became less of an interesting showcase for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Because Horian always said, Horian never, he, he is the most straightforward no bullshit guy I've ever met. So Horian just said, we can beat anyone if there's no time. We can beat anyone. It just takes longer to cook them. And as, But we were in a three-hour pay-per-view time block, right? So we did have to start dealing with the time issues. And I think it was that time issue that caused the problems for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, nothing else. They didn't have enough time to cook. Okay, now, now before, as you mentioned, before the first event, uh, you know, the, the guys were seeking a television deal, uh, and you obviously were working with SEG at the time, uh, and you mentioned you were 100% in, but however, do, do you feel, did you have any reservations about whether or not such a deal would lead to success? No. Never. You know, I'm a pretty opinionated guy. Um, I was also coming after, I was tweeting a little bit about this today. I, I mean, I don't think I've ever talked about this in any other interview. 
you know, I did a, a there's a shock comedian named Andrew Dice Clay, and you know, I had I had a very strong comedy background before you know creating the UFC, and I knew Andrew, uh, and he you know very controversial, and we did um, you know I was 100 percent sure his pay per view would do well, got him on the pay per view, it did huge business, uh, it helped me really understand how controversy and band and things like that can help drive interest in something. Again, you know, Izzy, remember, man, this is before Twitter. <laughs> you know, this is before the Internet, mostly. <laughs> so, you know, we really had to use uh, what's what's the joke people were using. There was no Facebook. It was just phone book. Um, you know, so we had to use a very old-fashioned medium to generate interest. Um, so, no, I knew the UFC was going to be a hit. I, 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 I one time, there was a... Um, Oh, who sent me the tape? Someone's. I think it might have been Marco Huas, but I don't, I pro, it doesn't seem right because this would have been later on. But I had a tape of. Oh no 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 no! I know what it was. It was a Gracie family tape where someone on the beach in Rio had insulted the Gracie family, and Hodion was narrating it. And it's this giant muscle guy in Ipanema or one of the you know Rio beaches, and. Big, big guy, you know, like six four, six five, big guy. And Horion, you hear him narrating this home video, the shaky home video. It's like a picnic on the beach. He's insulted the Gracie family. So we send the littlest cousin <laughs> to go teach him a lesson. And then you see like this fifteen year old kid go over, take this huge muscle man down and choke him unconscious. And I was looking at it. And, you know, we our office is, you know, a very fancy building in New York. Bertelsmann's a huge media company. And, you know, I was playing the tape loud, and I'm laughing, and one person comes in, three people come in. And then, like, the whole, that whole division of the company came in to see this tape because it was hilarious. And then you, and I kept playing it over and over, and they go, how does that guy do that? And that's the kind of impact the UFC had. Like, now, look, you know, 173, Dane is a genius. You know, Ronda's going to fight Floyd Mayweather. You know, Barraro's never, you know, he's got 10,000 victories he's never lost in the last century. You know, <laughs> Dana and the UFC is great at pumping stuff. Really, in every UFC show, every UFC pay per view, I think is, is worthwhile. They really, it's, the shows are great. But you've got to go back. When you go back and you see what it was, it was so different, it was so unique, it was so unusual that you could not watch it. You literally could not watch it. It, it. it it grabbed you by the throat. You know, talk about compelling viewing. If you liked fights or you liked the martial arts, or you liked combat sports, you had to watch this. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about in interviews is uh, uh, you, there's, there's, really, there's really three phases to the UFC if you count the, whatever phase it's, it's in now. There's the, the current phase, which I think goes from the ultimate fighter to the present. And then the, before that, there's the, the, that middle era that, you know, where Zufa was, you know, trying to bring it back from the dead, essentially, you know, political problems turned off on cable. But you've got to understand the first era of the UFC, the one I was running, was in some ways, in some ways bigger than it is now. I mean, the buy rates we were doing, it, you know, with one quarter of the pay-per-view universe that exists now, a lot of those buy rates in today's world would have been a million pay-per-view buys, you know? And, um, you know, I'm a cartoon in Mad Magazine. We did the cover story of Mad Magazine. I was the sleazy promoter. Uh, Marquis de Sade, you know, which is a joke on the Marquis de Sade, we were in Virtuosity, a huge movie with Denzel Washington and Russell Crowe. We were... The UFC in 1996 was the finale episode of Friends when Jennifer Aniston's boyfriend enters the UFC. So you've got to remember, 93, 94, 95, 96, the UFC is huge. It's, you know, I don't want to, it's not cult, it's not mainstream, but it's a really, really big deal. And it's in the media all the time. George Will, the famous Time uh, magazine columnist, he said, you know, Congress should be more like the UFC. The UFC is honest, straightforward, no bullshit. He said that's how Congress should be. So there, it was a crazy time back then, and I think 
you, you said you were seven or eight when that was happening. It's hard to put a perspective on that if you weren't actually there and as an adult. But the UFC was huge, and everybody knew about it. And it was also, you know, it, it was the political heat, but it was also the real buzz on it. It was the coolest thing going. Um, you know, and, and that's when people talk about, yeah, I love the spectacle, I love the circus, you know, what? yeah, whatever. I do love the circus, <laughs> you know. And to me, when, when you have Keith Hackney, a 200-pound Kempo master from Chicago fighting Manny Yarbrough, the 660-pound, you know, world champion amateur sumo, that's the fuck, that's the circus. Sorry, Izzy, I, I forgot if I, I, you know, occasionally lapse into the F word. But, you know, that was oh, a great no. fight. This is, you know. <laughs> this is the Campbell McLaren show. This is not, uh, this is all you. <laughs> you. You can say whatever you want. If you want to go on a Dana White type tirade, that's coming. No, no, no. Dana's got that covered. He's uh, he, He's got that uh, totally locked. I won't even attempt to do that. <laughs> that that actually leads me to my next question, which is obviously there was no no denying that the UFC was a, a great success. But do you do you feel as though the event, uh, despite his I mean, how can I phrase this? Uh, despite as many opposers labeling it cock, human cockfighting, how how successful do you think it was given the opposition? Well, you know, Izzy, your questions are really good, uh, but that question's backwards. Thank you. It was, yeah, it's a thoughtful question, but it's really the other way around. The more successful the UFC became, the more uh, the opposition built. Like, if we had not been popular, nobody would have cared. Um, you know, it became a great way for a uh, local politician, a governor, a uh, U.S. powerful U.S. senator to get a lot of attention without having to burn up any political capital. So like, in other words, so John McCain said, John McCain wanted, I believe he wanted a national boxing commission. And I think it, UFC's violence was a good way for him to get that. You know, so I think people use the UFC. And, and with the cable operators, you know, this seems so old-fashioned, but back then, cable's secret uh, to anyone not in the business is they made a lot of money from the adult programming. You know, they made it as much, some cable systems made as much as half their revenue from adult programming. And they were under a lot of pressure in 96, 97 to sort of rein that in. You know, America's a pretty, violence is good at times, but sex we're very uncomfortable with. So there was a lot of pressure in D.C. to sort of regulate the adult business on cable and a lot of the cable systems saw the UFC as a good way to give something back. All right, you're right. We won't run the porn. We will run the porn, but we'll turn off the UFC. So a lot of the UFCs, you know, the, the, the reaction to it was because it was so popular and so hot. You know, you were too young, but I'll tell you, a lot of people didn't like Mortal Kombat. Uh, and there were a number of video games that were literally being, you know, accused of being the end of Western civilization. You know, now it's like, are you serious? The country has actual problems. We're not going to worry about a video game. But back then, people really thought that video games were ruining society. So I think the UFC got popular, and it got super popular, and then it got a, to be a good target. You know, one time a CNN reporter came up to me and said, is, is it this actually human cockfighting? I said, no, the guys must wear pants. There's no, no, absolutely not. They've all got <laughs> pants on. You know, and she just didn't, she didn't know what to do with that answer. You know, it was like there was no sense of humor. It just was that sort of uh, fake outrage that sometimes media and politicians use. You know, um, I think that obviously as, you know, and you know this, I'm sure you know the real story on the rules. We, you know, was it a bit insane what we were doing initially? Yes, it was. Uh, did we start putting rules in pretty quickly? Yes, we did. Um, you know, we were legal in New York. Uh, we did an event in New York uh, in Buffalo, UFC 7. Uh, all the rules, the unified rules pretty much were in place before uh, it was sold to Zufa. So, 
you know, when, and when Big John got there too, you know, Big John's role in keeping everybody safe and making this a different thing, you, you can't you can't talk about that too much. So, um, you know, to come back to the question, I think the UFC was hurt by its success. It became so popular so quickly. I mean, you got to understand, within three years, this thing was huge, right? I mean, everybody was talking about it. Everyone was talking about the UFC. It, re it was literally everywhere. Um, and I would do things like uh, a TV Guide, which was at one time a very important magazine before there were, you know, you know 10,000 channels and uh, the Internet. If people actually read TV Guide to see what to watch. And at one point, TV guy said, this is, uh, what did they say, violent assault as entertainment. And I use that quote in a lot of our advertising. You know, so that's kind of the attitude we had. It's like, the more you criticize us, the more popular we become. Um, to the point, though, is once they finally turn you off, it doesn't matter how much everybody wants to see you if they can't see you. So I think, I think our success is what drove the opposition to a great extent. If we were, you know, unsuccessful and nobody cared, nobody would have been that fired up. Well, it seems it seems kind of ridiculous in hindsight that they would have a problem with that, but yet, well, you know, por por pornography was allowed to exist. Like on a, you know, it, it just seems kind of ridiculous to me. Uh, yes, whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> I, you know, I don't really. I don't even know. You know, yeah. America's a funny country. Sometimes, you know, we're very prudish in a lot of ways. Now, on on December sixteenth, nineteen ninety five, uh, you guys had a UFC event that went head to head with with a Mike Tyson fight. I believe he was fighting uh, Buster Mathis. Uh, now, Don yeah. King ended up shift, and Don King ended up shifting that fight from pay per view to network television. Do you think that was a case of him seeing the UFC as a legitimate uh, competition? Man, it's hard to see it as anything but that. Um, and, you know, it's a odd. It was a very odd set of circumstances. In the pay-per-view business back then, uh, and Floyd would be the same now, um, you, you, you avoid a Floyd fight, you avoid a Tyson fight, no matter what. You know, you totally don't go anywhere near it. Not just because they're going to get all the buys that night, but also they're going to soak up all the press, and they're going to soak up in the pay-per-view business there's the, the cross-channel spots. It's what the cable operators give to the pay-per-view producer to promote the show. So with a Tyson fight, all the spots on TV uh, went to Tyson. All the press went to Tyson, and all the buys went to Tyson. So you totally... Um, you know, you would avoid that at any cost. So we waited until Tyson set the date for his pay-per-view, and then we went in and set our ultimate ultimate. But you got to, you know, think about what that is. Eight guys that have been champions of another tournament all fighting each other. I mean, it was a pretty phenomenal night. Um, and, you know, I was very proud of the concept of the ultimate ultimate. And, you know, it just it seemed like nothing. To me, it was as good as almost the first UFC because – no one had done anything like that. And uh, I was particularly proud. I used um, uh, Tchaikovsky's music, uh, the tray pack from the Nutcracker, which is bum, 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 bum. You know, very, I just, Tchaikovsky's just rolling over in his grave hearing me do that. But it's a very famous piece of Christmas music, and it's called the Nutcracker. And we had pictures of, uh, uh, was it Keith Hackney whacking Joe Sons, uh you know, red speedo testicles over and over and over again while we played the uh, Nutcracker. So that was my own little joke uh, to myself. Anyway, so we did this, and um, then Tyson announces for the first time in 15 years they're going to move from pay-per-view to free television. There, that, that just hadn't happened. You know, the last time, I mean, the only other time I've heard about that is when Bellator canceled their pay-per-view and moved it over to Spike for free. Right? I mean, once you set the pay-per-view, and then Mathis was a tomato can. I mean, it wasn't a great fight, but you knew they were going to do, you know, that was a big money deal. So why did Don King do that? You know, why did he put himself on for free opposite the biggest, what we were hoping was going to be the biggest event we'd ever had? You know, it just can't be a coincidence. Um, 
you know, can I, is there an email that someone leaked to the Don said, we're going to put these guys out of business? No, I don't have that. It just seems like a really, really weird coincidence. And it shows back then there was a real fear that the UFC was going to really, really kill the boxing business. Um, now I think we see it's ridiculous. They're two, they're two different sports. They totally can coexist. Uh, they probably should coexist on a more uh, uh, concerted way now. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm working on that I don't, we'll talk about on my next visit, but, you know, I think there are ways to bring MMA and boxing together, and nobody's really looked at that since UFC won when I had Art Jimerson fight boys. So, um, weird set of circumstances. Don King, most powerful boxing promoter. Mike Tyson, the biggest draw on pay-per-view. Uh, and then they go on free TV for the first time in something like, you know, a decade and a half. You just odd circumstances. Izzy, if you can hear me, you're breaking up. Okay, I guess we lost our Campbell. Stand by, people. Hold on one second. Let me try to get him back on the line. Hello. Yes, I have no idea how we lost you, but I'm um, glad you're back. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, you know, I talk so much, Izzy. What happens is I think after a while the the, the equipment just starts to shut down. They just can't take <laughs> any more of my talking. So I don't know where I don't know what you got. You I I noticed uh, it was beeping on the line. Uh, you know, I was just saying it just can't be a coincidence that Don King took the biggest draw off pay per view on the same night that the UFC was doing their biggest show, hopefully their biggest show, and put it on free TV. It's just too star a coincidence. I, I completely agree. Uh, what I was mentioning before I got cut off, um, I was mentioning that we, we all know that Senator John McCain was one of the major oppositions against, you know, the UFC. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned that I, you know, I, grew, I was born and raised in New York, and so I'm well familiar with all the problems regarding sanctioning mixed martial arts that exist to this day. Uh, in 1987, uh, I remember George Pataki, the governor, uh, he banned uh, MMA, professional MMA, from New York, and that ban exists today. Uh, what do you say? What would you say is the turning point in, in getting people back on board? Because I know McCain, you know his, his uh, you know he was the opposition, and he led, you know, it led to 36 states banning uh, MMA. What do you think was the turning point in getting people back on your side? Oh, it was a matter of the controversy and the heat needed to just die down um, to a great extent. You know, the New York issues are nothing to do with safety, sports, MMA. It is solely to do with the, you know, uh, culinary workers union, the union and legal issues uh, surrounding, uh, you know, Sheldon Silver's backers. And it has nothing to do with MMA. It's just, it's just New York crappy Albany politics has nothing to do with MMA. But remember, when the UFC started to codify the rules and create the the, the, um, the unified rules, Nick Lembo uh, from the New Jersey Athletic Commission being a huge part of that, uh, and David Isaacs, who my old and dear friend who I worked with at, at, at Bertelsmann, you know, worked with Nick to put that together. You know, getting New Jersey to uh, pass it, that was a big deal. Letting the heat die down, that was a big deal. Um, showing that the guys were, you know, primarily, you know, Olympic athletes, right? College-level wrestlers and Olympic wrestlers. It, you know, we, we started to show that this was not brawlers, 
that guys like Mark Schultz, who was an Olympic gold medalist, came into it. Um, you know, Couture and a lot of other guys who were very established athletes. So I think the level of the Olympic athlete and college uh, wrestling uh, background changed it. I think the heat came off, you know, just because people sort of moved on to the next thing and they couldn't see it and it just wasn't as hot or wasn't as successful. Um, I think McCain got to Claire a little bit of a victory in that he shut it off. Um, New York was a very New York is a very different one. Uh, it's different than the other 49 states. And remember, Izzy, I was saying banned in 49 states after we'd been in seven states. I kept saying that. Nobody counted. You know, nobody went, Campbell, that would mean 56 states. Not a single person ever asked me. You know, I was going around saying banned in 49 states. And we were in uh, 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 Colorado, Oklahoma, New York, uh, uh, um, where my North Carolina, you know, we, Wyoming, we were, you know, I'm banned in 49 states and nobody ever counted, you know. Uh, so I don't think the press was the most discerning group when it came to the UFC. I think they liked a certain story and didn't want to look into it more than that. The reason New York is different is there's a real union issue between, you know, uh, the casino workers are trying to unionize casinos in Nevada and they're teaming up with the New York hotel or culinary workers here. Uh, and that's just, you know, that has nothing to do with MMA. The problem in New York was the UFC was legal in New York. We'd done a great event at uh, uh, Veterans, Aud, uh, Veterans Auditorium in Buffalo. It was a great event, UFC 7. We were scheduled to come back. Buffalo loved the UFC. We were providing jobs and income. And, you know, upstate New York is not you know, a thriving area. Um, so, you know, we were pretty popular there. And then we also, uh, the company had a very famous consultant. We were actually written into law uh, and were made legal in New York. But another group, a wannabe group of producers, it was Bob Guccione's son. I think it was Bob Guccione. They announced they were going to do Madison Square Garden. Um which they weren't. They were. They didn't. They weren't for real. And that sort of set off Giuliani. You know, Mayor Giuliani fought the mafia. Mayor Giuliani ran down to the World Trade Centers after the planes crashed into them. Ran, went right there. He was like Winston Churchill in World War Two. Giuliani fought the mafia. I was somewhat concerned about McCain. You know, but Giuliani was against it. I was like, oh no, we're doomed. Um, because he's like Wyatt Earp, you know what I mean? He, he The mafia doesn't scare him, you know? And McCain's a tough guy, war hero, decor, you know, I get it. Uh, but I think New York was different because it, somehow it got personal with the governor and it got personal with the mayor of New York. And I think they went after something that wasn't really there. Um, and then, you know what, i tell you, sometime maybe we should talk about this. There's also nobody's ever looked into why Floyd Patterson, you know, the boxing commissioner, was forced out of office. Uh, it's a very sad story. Floyd was a great boxer. I admired him. He was a nice man. He took the fall for a number of things that the, the politicians did, um, which was really not right. So I think New York is just shows when you have so many different influences and when money is involved, and it doesn't really have to do with the safety of MMA, MMA fighters. It has everything to do with politics. So I think New York was different. Is I think the rest of the country just needed to cool down, take a cold shower, relax, let the rules be put into place, and watch the UFC, which is a great event. I mean, the rest of the country sort of figured it out. New York is, you know, New York's like a 19th century political, you know, corrupt backwater in some ways. No kidding, and that leads me to this. I mean, you, you know, I understand the problems with the culinary union in Nevada, but Sheldon Silva has gone on record in saying that there's not a lot of, like, support for legalizing MMA and as far as the MMA, MMA bill goes, and I thought that was ridiculous. What are your thoughts on that, like him saying that there's no support? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. There's total support. There's no there's, – you know what? It's the other way around. There's nobody really against it. It's just political, you know, machinations. You know, no one in this state. You know what? New York has real problems, like taxes that are too high 
and unemployment in areas that are way out of whack with what New York City is, and problems with the schools, and problems with clean water in some places, and problems with the infrastructure. Those are problems, not MMA. Come on. There's no support for it. You know what? These guys are so busy greasing each other's skids. You know, that you know whatever. Uh, don't get me. I mean, who, who likes politicians? That would be nobody. <laughs> I think that's the more uh, pressing matter that we need to get to is who likes politicians. Yeah, you know, it, nobody. <laughs> it's, 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 funny, it's funny that you bring that up, though, because uh, the, the part about living in New York, because that's the reason why I moved from New York to South Florida, because I couldn't possibly live there. It was hard to find. I came out of the Navy, got out of the Navy in uh 2007, and I just I couldn't live there. I couldn't do anything. Like I I couldn't do anything at all. So I moved down south. So it, it's it's a very valid point, and yet these people are more concerned about you know MMA, even though it's sanctioned and it's legal and it's and it's safe for the most part. Um, you you know uh, you know it's a combat sport, so there's all there's an inherent danger in that. But car racing is very dangerous. There's a lot of dangerous things that we do. Uh, I will say this. Is, first off, I love Southern Florida. I love Miami. And I live in New York, and I have for a long time, and I do love New York City. Uh, but we're building Combate Americas, uh, you know, my new venture. We're going to build that in Miami as our headquarters because I refuse to build out a company in a state that doesn't allow MMA. Um, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and I do like Miami. We've done our events. We did the TV series down there. Um, I think that the thing I like about Miami and the South Florida area is I think there's a great deal of undiscovered talent down there, uh, both as fighters, as trainers, um, and, of course, on the creative side, there's so many talented people in the area. Uh, I love the joke, why do so many South Americans like Miami? Uh, it's because it's so close to the U.S. I love it that Miami feels like it's in South America, but it's, you know, it's very American, too, South Beach thongs. You know, you got to love it, um, and I think it's a great home for Combate Americas and a great place. You know, I mean, fighters want warm weather, too. <laughs> That's a big part of it. You know, it's, uh, you know, I think I think what New York's doing is just, it, you know, it's just, it's just gross politics. And, you know, Sheldon Silver it does not care one bit about fighters. You know, he doesn't care about fighter safety, fighter purses. He doesn't even know. You know, he, he, it's not what he thinks about. What he cares about is staying in office, continuing to make money, like every other politician. You know, there's a lot of us that do care about fighters. And keeping MMA out of New York is not helping any single person. So Now, I, ironically, and I, I could be off on this one, but isn't amateur MMA uh, allowed in New York? Last I checked, it was. Yeah, no, absolutely it is, which is ridiculous. Also, it's funny, there's a number of underground fights. Uh, I went to one once. There was a Nat Geo TV team there, and the Daily News was covering it. And I thought, you know, back when we started the UFC, I was always hearing rumors of underground fights, a kumite, you know, an underground, a closed subway station, you know, a back alley in Chinatown, a warehouse fight. You know, I kept hearing about these. I never found one ever, by the way. So, uh, you know, we kept hearing about this, but I think that, the strange thing, I finally went to an underground fight in New York City, uh, and it was up, it was in the Bronx, and like I said, there was a Nat Geo camera crew there for some TV show, and the Daily News was covering it. I thought, you know, how underground is this when the media's here? So who knows what's happening in New York? It's obviously, it's just stupid. The, the politician's inactivity is probably putting people's, uh, you know, safety in danger. That's what I think. I think that always seemed counterproductive for me in a sense that if you allow amateur MMA where it's a lot less safer than in the professional ranks, I mean, if they look at that and say, okay, somebody's getting hurt, then maybe that's exactly what happened in the pro ranks. So it seems counterproductive in a sense. Uh, yes, I think you're being kind, but I, I'll leave it at that. Yes, counterproductive. <laughs> I'm trying, trying to be nice. I, I know you have a couple of minutes left, so I, I wanted to get into your your current product, which is Combate Americas. Uh, you make you, you know you recently made your return with the the launching of Combate Americas. Can you talk about uh, how the idea came about and what do you hope to accomplish with it? 
Yes, uh, delighted to. So, uh, Combate Americas really comes out. I tried something a couple of years ago called the Iron Ring, which I took more heat for from the MMA community uh, than anything I've ever done. Uh, and it was really like a hip hop UFC. And I had uh, some very famous rappers put together teams of fighters and famous guys, T.I., Nelly, Ludacris, Little John, you know, very famous rappers. And then some guy that couldn't sing named Floyd Mayweather. And uh, I gave them, you know, we found fighters. And there were not, at that time, you know, I just have to, you know, I, I, I'm sure this wasn't on purpose, but there were not a lot of African Americans in the UFC. You know, just go back four or five years. And I think a lot of it was a lot of African American fight athletes were in the boxing world and not really a ton in wrestling and jiu-jitsu, you know, and more of the grappling arts. So I sort of sourced a lot of guys, and Brian Rogers, the predator in um, uh, Bellator, was one of the guys we found. Marcus Brimage, who I think is a really exciting fighter. He's had a couple injury problems, but I think he's on the way back, you know, with the UFC. Uh, Mike Easton, who, you know, I, I forget his nickname, Little Hulk, Mini Hulk, I mean, a very exciting fighter. So I found some very good guys, and but it was, you know, you know, in the hip hop world, the whole thing is, you know, it's all how you posture, right? Yo, I know everything about MMA, yo. And a lot of the guys didn't know shit about MMA, yo. And uh, so I think a lot of the MMA fans liked the show, and, I, you know, it was shot by Jeff Symbolist, who who made the narco uh, soccer movies, uh, you know, for ESPN's 3030. He made uh, Favela Rising. He's a great filmmaker. The show looked great. It was great to watch, great stories, did great TV ratings, but didn't really garner an MMA audience. So there was no way to, you know, I couldn't turn that into a franchise. It was a TV show. So, you know, you know I, I don't like to be negative, but it was four or five years ago. It did better ratings than just about every other reality MMA show ever been on TV except for The Ultimate Fighter. And, it, you know, it was doing over a million, million, two viewers on BET. So the ratings were great, but I couldn't turn it into a franchise. It wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to lead to pay-per-view. It wouldn't generate, you know, a live event tour. So it didn't work. Um, and as I was doing that, I started to do, I, I did a bilingual talk show for Telemundo called Tonight Con Lorenzo Pato and started to really understand, you know, Spanish language TV and bilingual, you know, uh, movement in, 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 you know, in our culture and got fascinated with that. And then it really, you know, it was like a light bulb went off. And it's a funny story, kind of, you know. Uh, I went to see the UFC in Indianapolis. My mom had been very sick. Uh, this is three years ago, four, three and a half years ago. And Dana and, and Rogan, you know, Joe Rogan's an old friend of mine. And Dana's always been very gracious to me. So I was at, you know, I was with my mom who was sick and I needed a night out. And I'd gone to visit her. So I went to the UFC and I said, Rogan, Dude, I gotta hang out. You need, you know, I'm depressed. You know, my mom, when you're aging, when your parents are old and not doing well, it's a sad setup, you know. So I went to have a night out, and I hung with Rogan, and he was Rogan. He's the greatest, and you know, he's screaming his head off and arguing with me and telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, typical stuff. You know, you love it. And um, and Dana said something like, uh, "I'll cheer you up. Why don't you go by the trailer where the Octagon Girls are?" And Izzy, I'm married. I'm coming up married 28 years. My wife is fantastic. Totally love her. I'm not looking for an octagon girl. But to tell you the truth, I did go to the trailer uh, because <laughs> why not? <laughs> and, you know, I remember seeing the girls, and I thought, they're so pretty, you know, and tall. They're all taller than me. And skinny, you know, like models, right? And I thought, you know, as I was thinking about a Latin a Hispanic fight franchise, I go, you know, these girls are really pretty, but they're way too skinny. This is not going to work. This is not what Latinas look like. And it was sort of then I started to really think, well, what would what would a Hispanic fight franchise have? And uh, it's not just, you know, hot Latinas bent over, uh, you know, as octagon girls. It's um, the music, the soundtrack, the feeling, the national pride, the sense that, you know, to non-Hispanic Americans, like this one big lump of Spanish-speaking people, but you know and I know, 
You know, Mexicans are so proud of Mexican heritage and so proud to be American. Puerto Ricans, so proud to be Puerto Rican and knows they're part of America. Venezuelans, Colombians, Cubans, Dominicans, you know, everybody coming up from Ecuador and Nicaragua. You know, people want to be American. They want to come to America. They want to work. They want to build a better life. And that pride, like someone explained it to me, you can love your mom and your dad. You can love the home country and you love America. It's not a conflict. You know, I'm an immigrant. I was seven when I came from Scotland. I'm not Hispanic, but I know what it's like to be so proud of the new country. And I thought, here I have a chance to build an America. People sometimes in interviews, Izzy, I get very pissed off because they go, well, how is this going to play in Latin America? Well, I don't really give a fuck. This is an American show. It's for Americans. Hispanics are American, by the way. Right? You know, yes. You know, so what did I want to do? I wanted to build uh, Combate Americas, which means the Fighting Americas, with an S, because everyone, if you're American and you're Hispanic, you know there's a lot of Americas. There's North America, South America, Central America, Latin America. There's a lot of Americas. For a lot of Americans tend to think there's just one, and it, it doesn't even have an A on it, right? It's American. It's American. Just totally American. Uh, this is for everybody, you know? And I think the style of fight you see is a little more stand-up and a little more from Boxeo. I think that the guys are new. They're different. They're exciting. We've discovered some really good young guys. We are not looking to find people that have been released from other fight promotions. Um we are looking to find new, exciting fighters that are building a career and maybe haven't been discovered by Dana yet or Joe Silva. When I talk to Joe, I never tell him the name of a single person I'm looking at. You know, uh, We're discovering these guys. They're new. They're young. They're, they're pretty different. Um, Level Martinez, not young, and you can check him out on YouTube. Level is his nickname because that's what happens to his opponents when he fights them. So two million people have seen him on YouTube. Uh, he's kind of the Hispanic Kimbo Slice. Danny Morales, uh, Machine Morales out of Chicago. Not just me, the promoter, seeing this. A lot of people compare him to a young Floyd. His hands are so fast, a really exciting MMA fighter that really could be a boxer. I think we found some great guys. Daddy Yankee, the best guy in the world, reggaeton superstar. He's the front man. He's the commissioner for the organization. Yankee started as a boxer. He actually had five professional fights before he dislocated his left shoulder. So he loves fighting. He loves fighters. And he's gotten so into MMA. You know, first love was boxing. But he wants to know what's up with MMA. So I've got the support of Spanish celebrities. We're on Mundos, you know, which is kind of like MTV in Spanish, bilingual. Um, we're on the verge of announcing our live event series. I wish I'd give you the scoop. It's just not done. It's not totally ready to go. But our live event series will kick off in September in Miami. Uh, exciting fighters, great celebrities. I think a little bit new take. You know, somebody said to me, how different can it be? And I said, look, you know, is an enchilada different from a pizza? Because it's essentially the same ingredients, right? But it tastes different. So, um, you know, I think we've got a fun show, a fun franchise. I think you're going to see new, exciting guys. It is not a competition in any way to the UFC. I love the UFC with my whole heart. I think of the UFC as one of my children. You know, I really gave birth to the UFC. I helped create it. This is different. This is maybe for fans that don't know anything about MMA but have heard of it, right? This is a whole new group of fans, Hispanic fans, that maybe have heard but don't know what to do. Now, what 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 should we expect as fans? What should we expect of Combate Americas? Um, I, you know, I think one you're going to see just a little bit. You know, here's a here's a good analogy. If you like basketball, right? And if you're, you know, if if do you live in Miami? Thirty minutes southwest. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I don't need to tell you about basketball, right? So you've got a great team there, right? And the pros. You know, you know how the pros play. Late in the season, late in the game, they start actually playing, right? I mean, they save it, they wait till it gets near the playoffs, then they turn it on. If you watch college basketball, guys, the moment their feet touch wood, play their hearts out. 
You know, I think that's a little bit what you'll see with Combate Americas. If I take a new kid like Danny Morales, who's 22, and I have Daddy Yankee, Chino Inacho, uh, Hoist Gracie, and Eddie Alvarez, because they're all in my show, and I put them around, you know, La Jaula, which is Spanish for the cage. I think it's such a badass name, by the way. It's how Spanish is such a great language. La Jaula. It sounds like a monster movie to me, you know? It sounds so much better than The Cage, The Cage, you know, La Jaula. So you've got Danny Morales and you've got, you know, Hoyce, who is MMA royalty, Eddie Alvarez, you know, Daddy Yankee, a bunch of celebrities, and you give that kid a shot, that kid is going to fight like there's no tomorrow. So I think you see, I just think you see an energy level and an enthusiasm, um, you know, that's, that, that's, that I think is going to be unique and I think is going to add an, another level to this. You know, are we a feeder system for the UFC? You know, worse things could happen. Are you going to see exciting fights? Oh, hell yes. So that's kind of what I think you should look for. Okay, and, and this is the final question, because if not, I can probably keep you for 48 hours. No, straight. and you know, I, you were very gracious. You know, you guys are giving me plenty of time, and you know, I do, I do have an out. You, you can tell I like to talk, and this is oh, no. my favorite subject. So, But we'll, we'll have to do it again, Izzy. Okay, well, with, with that said, I'll give you this final question, and, and that'll be all. This is actually my final question. Um, with Combate Americas focusing on Latin America and the UFC actually having a season of tough down there, um, do you feel as though now is as good a time as any to tap into Latin America's resources as far as fighters are concerned? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, yes is the absolute answer. Um, and, you know, look at the UFC. The UFC is a world-class, world-dominating machine. They are going to keep uh, – their need for new fighters, new talent is going to be continual, right? They're doing a lot of shows. So they absolutely need to tap into Latin America. If you ask me where is Latin America in its development of MMA, that's a different question. The UFC's need is continual, right? You've got to feed the beast, right? And the UFC is a beast. So uh, obviously Brazil, obvious, right? They've been valet tudo, you know, and, you know, those guys have been fighting on concrete floors, you know, for 70, 80 years. And, you know, tough guys just get tougher down there. Brazil's different. From what I know, Mexico is developing quickly, right? And it's getting there. And I've seen a couple really good guys come out of Mexico, but I don't think it's there yet. I think it needs to develop. I understand Peru has kind of a big scene. Um, you know, uh, Colombia and Venezuela. Venezuela is having so many political problems, I doubt you could really effectively scout down there. Um, you know, the thing, the thing I like about Mexico is well, the thing I like about Mexico is pretty much everything, by the way. Um, you know, I think Mexicans like a style of fighting that uh, sometimes is called a ruda. It's a brawler, right? Rocky, you know, thick head, can't knock me out, keep banging. You know, I think that's a Mexican style of fighting. It's all Corazon, right? It's uh, La Sangra Azteca, you know, Aztec blood, you know, dude, tough guy. That's what the Mexicans like. That's what I like, too, by the way. So I like that a lot. The skill level, I think that has to come up. But, you know, as they say, you can't teach heart. You know, you can't teach heart. So I think in terms of the interest level, the fighting background, the love of combat sports, that's all there. What's the actual skill level like? I, you know, I think it's got to mature. Um, but you got to get it, you know. The UFC needs talent. I am primarily looking for guys in the U.S., by the way. Um, you know, I'm really looking for Americans, Hispanic Americans. So that's kind of my gig. Is that an answer? Oh, absolutely. Wonderful answer. And with that, I, I want to thank you again. I, I know you said it was a strong word, but it truly, truly is. If you would have told me... <laughs> 20 years ago that I would talk to one of the co-founders of UFC, I'd be like, what? You know, I would have, wouldn't have believed it. But, again, it was a tremendous honor, Campbell. I really thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk to you. So I hope you guys have me back, and, you know, I hope a lot of people listening, uh, you know, get everybody to follow me on Twitter, uh, at Campbell Combate. That's what we did. 
oh, we'll get we'll get right on that. Trust me when I tell you. I mean, you you saw for yourself. We tweet like every. You know, I I, I so. sure did. I sure did. So great. <laughs> we'll so I look that. forward to our next conversation. As do I. Thank you, sir, and have a okay. have a wonderful weekend. All right. Thanks.